Welcome everybody to the 1230 presentation. I am Shane Golos, your host, and I'm also host of the Shaping Fire podcast. If you love learning from the top speakers in the industry, uh, I encourage you to check out shapingfire.com where my podcast is hosted, and also um, our YouTube channel where you'll find over 100 videos unique there and not available anywhere else. Um, uh, I record speakers uh, like today and uh, I take it home and I put it on my YouTube channel. So if you are not able to go to all the conventions and you want to hear some of these hot speakers that aren't speaking near where you live, I encourage you to check out the Shaping Fire YouTube channel. Our presentation right now is from uh, Eric Vlosky from Go Pure Pressure. He'll be speaking on solventless extraction explained, rosin, bubble hash, and dry sift. Uh, Eric is a founding member of Mass Roots and is now Director of Marketing at Pure Pressure in Denver, Colorado. Eric has worked with cannabis companies in every facet of the industry, and today we'll be talking about solvents, solventless extraction techniques. Thank you, Eric. All right, thank you so much. Uh, thank you all for coming. I'm going to try and make this as informative and interesting as possible. Uh, I'm really excited about solventless extraction, and thank you all for being here. By show of hands, how many people here feel that they are at least somewhat familiar with solventless extraction? Okay. Great, that's what I was hoping for. Uh, the beginning of this is gonna be a little bit higher surface level and then we're really gonna kinda get into some details. Uh, some of the topics we're gonna be covering today, it'll be about 30 minutes of presentation and then I'd like to leave you know, at least 15 for Q&A at the end. Uh, we were getting a lot of questions at the booth so I wanna make sure that we can answer as many of your questions as possible. So what we're going to go through today is uh, a lay of the land of extraction in general and where solventless fits into that, uh, some of the advantages and challenges of solventless extraction, how it might fit into your facility or someone that you know, uh, the popular types of products and textures, as well as you know myths and what solventless can and can't do. So this should give everyone in here a pretty good idea of what solventless extraction is all about, where it's heading in the next year or two, things are changing very quickly. And the main products that we will be focusing on are ice water extracts, you know, otherwise known as bubble hash, dry sift or keef, and of course rosin, kind of, which is becoming the big daddy of them all. So I'd like to preface this conversation by basically saying that, you know, the future of cannabis really is processing. Uh, in your average grocery store, anywhere from 10 to 20% of the perishable items are actually produce. Virtually everything else in a grocery store has been processed in one way or another. So what we're really looking at is cannabis being pretty much the most versatile drug for recreational purposes and medical purposes that can be turned into so many different things. Everything from every edible that you can ever imagine, people are already seeing that, vape pens, dabs and concentrates of every texture that you've ever seen and perhaps have never heard of. Uh, we are pretty much on the cusp of a global market and it's easy for us to kind of lose sight, you know, in our states where we can't even move products across state lines. Things are very siloed and segmented in the Northwest. Some of the concentrates are starting to make their way up here. A lot of the popular textures that people are paying $100 a gram for in California are now starting to be produced in Oregon and Washington where, you know, they've been in California and Colorado for a year or two already. So a lot of the trends are coming out of Colorado and California, but I think as time goes on, we're really going to see products that are sold out for potentially a year at a time. Boutique growers that are so popular with their concentrates and their products, once those products can cross state lines, that you'll be seeing people back ordered for who, who knows how long. And this is kind of focusing a little bit where solventless really fits in, is in the boutique, end of the market, really high-end products. Um, so going more from that, uh, you know, more and more consumers are seeking concentrated products. And we're gonna go into some facts and some data a little bit later in the presentation, but anyone that follows MJ Biz, uh, New Frontier, Headset, a lot of these great data sources, pretty much concentrates are being consumed more and more at the expense of flour. So a high uh, amount of flour is basically being converted into concentrates and as Colorado, Washington, 
Nevada, California, those are some of the main areas that decent data is available on. Uh, year over year, concentrate consumption growth, not just solventless, but all concentrates in general, is increasing. And we expect to see that same trend over time in pretty much all maturing markets that once cannabis becomes legal, people are very excited, they're purchasing joints and flour, and you know, this is great. And then their taste preferences tend to change. They say, oh, well, how about edibles? And, and what is a dab? And, and what is that gonna do for me? And of course, as people's tolerances grow, they're looking for different experiences. Uh, so pretty much across the board in Colorado and California, concentrate growth is right around 25, 23%, depending on where you're getting your data from that as a percentage of the products sold. Uh, in the Northwest, the data that we've been told is right around 18%, so there's definitely still room there where it's growing. There's a lot more consumption of concentrates that's going to be happening virtually everywhere as the markets expand. So to really define solventless extraction, what we're looking at is a process of mechanical separation. And mechanical separation is different from using solvents because what you're having is various physical forces that are separating the trichomes and the cannabinoids as opposed to dissolving them in a solvent. So when you're running butane, any hydrocarbon, CO2, uh, any of those solvent-based processes, what you're running into is a dissolution of the cannabinoids and terpenes, and then you're reforming that, taking things out, you know, recovering your solvents. So mechanical separation is anything from shearing, uh, breaking things open with rosin, and we'll get into that, but that really is the main distinction. And what I'm not gonna spend time talking as much today is what's better, because people have all kinds of different taste preferences. Uh, we believe at Pure Pressure that there are solvent-based concentrates that are absolutely elite and made very well and when purged properly. But what we've also seen is that a lot of companies will take products that uh, aren't the highest quality necessarily, and then they will use that to put that through certain hydrocarbon and other systems. So one of the big things that we're gonna talk about today is where quality fits into the equation and how quality is such a big part of being successful with solventless concentrates. But it's important to understand that when you're actually making a solventless concentrate, you're not dissolving it with a solvent. Seems pretty straightforward, but that's one of the questions that we get all day, every single day. Uh, to go back a little bit, you know, hash is being made for as long as a millennia, almost. The, the earliest reference that I could find when researching for this presentation was 1123, that there's references of hash being made in the Middle East. So solventless concentrates, you could call it that, have technically been around for maybe a thousand years or more. Uh, people have been making hash in various ways all across the world, uh, mainly concentrated in Asia, in the Middle East, where it was getting started collecting resin from cannabis plants, forming it in different ways. I'm sure a lot of people, especially people who have been you know, consuming and been around for a lot longer than I have, Thai sticks, Turkish hash, all kinds of different products that before were the concentrated potency increasers that people were consuming, and now we're seeing this absolutely massive proliferation of different textures, concentrates, extraction methods, everything that you can imagine. Uh, so hash has been around for a really long time. I'm sure a lot of people here may fondly remember, you know, sprinkling keef on a bowl or a little bit of brown bubble hash and, you know, increasing the potency of whatever they were smoking and layering it into a joint. And now you've got, you know, 99.9% .9 pure THCA distillate that will take you to the moon and back uh, in a tiny little dab. So we've seen a massive, massive evolution in the way that concentrates are being produced and we expect that to continue. I mean, this is really the tip of the iceberg with solventless concentrates as well as solvent-based, and who knows if there's other categories that are gonna get developed that we're not even really aware of right now. I mean, this is really all just getting started. So, pretty much where we're at with the main separation here. So, I just wanted to give everyone a little bit of a lay of the land. I think a lot of people have familiarity with concentrates in general, but just to kind of educate everyone on where things break down, uh, these are the primary methods of solvent-based. Distillate is, can be run without solvents, such as in steam distillation, uh, or it can be used with solvents. And, of course, the main solventless categories that we're gonna spend most of our time talking about today. So, 
One thing that you'll notice here is that on the bottom of this fairly busy slide is that there's a lot of textures. And one of the things that we run into a lot is that people are saying, well, can I, can I make shatter with a rosin press? And the answer is that you can most of the time. Now, with hydrocarbon, you're looking at a much bigger array of you know, various textures that you can actually access compared to CO2, for example, or ethanol, or distillate. Simply put, uh, hydrocarbon and rosin tend to be the most versatile in terms of the textures that you can actually create with those systems. So, you know, live resin, terpene separation, diamonds, shatter wax, butter, I mean, there's a lot of ways to skin a cat with how many different forms and textures there are. A lot of it comes down to personal preference. You know, if you could go back in time three, four years and start talking to people about diamonds and sauce, they would have no idea what your that, applesauce, like what are you even talking about? They don't know. Shatter was of course this huge revolution. People were taking dabs and it was pretty much all made with butene sometimes at home, sometimes in a very sketchy, on fire, you know, <laughs> not, not a very friendly environment to be doing that kind of thing. But now people are figuring out all kinds of very, very interesting ways to make a kaleidoscope of textures with different terpene concentrations, uh, all kinds of different flavors. It's really becoming such a boutique industry across the board that now, as well as in the solventless category, where before we were really just looking at Keef, bubble hash, older forms of hashish, you know, if anyone's familiar with Frenchy cannoli or some of, you know, the big name older hash makers, you know, there's all these different ways to make solventless, but now rosin has really come onto the scene as a popular concentrate that's growing very quickly in the past couple years. Uh, one other thing I'd like to point out too is that while CO2, ethanol, and distillate, I just have them listed as oils, a lot of these products are being used as substrates for edibles. So depending on what you're trying to do, uh, virtually any of these products can go into edibles, which then of course your complexity of the products that you can offer is times a million because how many things can we eat? Uh, there are better and less better ways to make edibles depending on what you're shooting for. But one of the things that we run into again a lot is that you know what, what can rosin really do? What can you actually turn rosin into? And the answer is that almost everything that you can with hydrocarbon, which we've actually been surprised by some of our clients who have been actually taking us to school on what they can do with some of our equipment. Uh, people are doing full on terpene separations, live rosin with fresh frozen bubble hash that they're washing. People are making solventless diamonds. You can make shatter with certain strains depending on the terpene concentrations. I mean, wax, all the other textures are all being made by certain companies on rosin presses as well. So it's pretty cool to see that you can spend a lot less on equipment and potentially make some of these textures. Uh, I'm not gonna spend time talking about the hydrocarbon and the other systems in this presentation, but I just kinda wanted to show everyone where the textures break down because there, there's a lot of variation here and it's, it's something we hear about a lot. So I wanted to cover some myths that, again, these are all based on questions that we get in our inbox and getting called all day, every day, is that solventless is less potent. That's the first one. Uh, people have found a way to isolate THCA with a rosin press where you're getting 99% potency with it, where it's white crystals that are coming out and they're nucleating those crystals into the large diamonds and then sometimes they're putting them into other products. But the fact of the matter is, is that with a solventless setup, you can actually make extremely potent uh, concentrated products. At Chalice of last year, the highest rosin test result of just a dabable oil product was in the low 90% range, so extremely potent. And generally speaking, and this is something we're gonna talk about a lot, is it really boils down to quality and, and what's in there in the first place. So if you're running very high quality material, the potency of your solventless concentrates can be extremely high. 60% uh, tends to be what we've seen test result wise to kind of be the bottom threshold. Uh, and, and that's not necessarily a bad thing. Not everyone wants to take a dab of THC isolate. I mean, I know I don't, it's, too, it, it's not really what I want. Uh, some people are looking for a little bit more of a mellow experience, and they can have that with a solventless product. Uh, the second one, shatter does not equal BHO. You know, one, one of the biggest misconceptions that we hear is, 
can, what, what is shatter? You know, what is this even? And shatter is just simply a texture of cannabis concentrates that behaves like a thin glass. You can break it with your hands, it flakes. Uh, there's a couple companies out there that have really perfected the process of making rosin shatter, and it's one of the more popular products that a lot of companies, especially a couple years ago, you know, it is popular, it was popular, it depends on which state you're in, but sometimes shatter is the buzzword, shatter equals concentrates, people almost don't even think about the other textures, it's just shatter, shatter, shatter. People are making shatter with solventless uh, concentrate setups. The third big one here is that solventless has less terpenes. You know, terpene content we've seen tested as high as 16% or more, just slightly over with solventless sauce. Uh, that's a company called DabLogic here in Denver that we work with. It's pretty incredible some of the test results that people are getting with their material. Uh, they're able to get, I mean, e even some of the lower range, huh? bubble hatch rosins are getting five to 10% terpene content. So when you open that jar, it, it, you know, it's, it's hitting you, you're smelling it, it's extremely potent. And what you're really finding is that you're getting a full spectrum extract. Uh, with most rosin, you're finding that as well as with bubble hash. And just as an aside, even though it's not up here, just for everyone's information, full spectrum basically means that you have a range of cannabinoids and terpenes and virtually all solventless concentrates are going to offer a full spectrum package, meaning you haven't distilled it down to simply just THCA, even though, just like we talked about, that can basically be done here, uh, but you're offering the full range of terpenes and cannabinoids, depending on what the plant is giving you, which can lead to the entourage effect, more palliative effects for certain people. Uh, it's basically gonna be the most genuine representation of whatever plant that was grown when it's being processed into solid, that tends to be the most genuine and authentic way of making a concentrate. The last one, hemp can't be used. Uh, hemp is being processed into CBD hash and people are selling that even on the internet. I mean, in Canada, it's the wild west west right now. It's absolutely bonkers up there. You can buy CBD hash rosin on the internet today and have it mailed to your door. I wouldn't recommend it. Uh, you do not want, you know, people, <laughs> you don't want the FBI knowing that you're buying that from Canada. Uh, one thing that we've heard a lot too is people haven't had great experiences with rosin. You know, for all the people that have had burnt popcorn flour rosin, I'm sorry, you know, the industry is still learning. <laughs> Uh, but now out there you will find products if you look for them that are the highest end that you can pretty much imagine and we're really excited to see where hemp can be used with rosin uh, it's a process that doesn't play as nice with solventless extraction for reasons I'll get into but it's pretty exciting what people are doing across the board here with extremely potent concentrates uh, the textures that we're talking about the terpene content and being able to use hemp in it as well so to kind of get to the beef here, uh, we've got our three primary categories of solventless concentrates. Uh, ice water hash, this is one probably most people are familiar with, at least at some level, and that's where you're using cold, cold water and ice. Uh, they're breaking and making the trichome heads and stalks brittle, and they're breaking it off of the canvas material itself into a slurry of water, which is then filtered through different micron screens and then it's dried. So that, that's the basic process of making bubble hash. It's made by hand in drums. It is made in portable washing machines that people would buy for using out in the back country. People make bubble hash in all kinds of different ways and probably something that will continue to be improved upon. We feel that that is actually one of the categories that is expecting to see the greatest evolution here in the next couple of years because Many of the professional bubble hash washers out there are either washing by hand or again using one of these, you know, two or three hundred dollar, you know, portable plastic washing machines, making grams of bubble hash full melt that sells for a hundred dollars a gram in California. You know, there's, there's something there's something not right there. Uh, but if that's what it takes to make that product, then people are doing a very good job of it. Uh, the drying process is something that has been extremely tricky and has been the realm of virtually experts only until just recently. Drying bubble hash, you have this wet, sopping mass of trichome heads and stalks if you're doing it right. And then to actually dry that down so you're not getting mold, microbial issues, it's a very tricky process doing with air drying. But now people have found out that with the lyophilization process, using freeze dryers, 
you can pretty much take all the headache out of making bubble hash by popping it in a freeze dryer and 24 hours later it comes out perfectly dried. It's a little more complicated than that, but point being it's a lot easier to do than air drying and, and you don't have to be an absolute tried and true 10 year veteran of drying it. Uh, dry sifter keef, again, this is probably gonna be the most familiar category. My picture is pretty blown out there, so you can't see it. Just pretend that there's keef in that little box. Uh, what we've got here is instead of taking your cannabis material and putting it through water to break off those trichome heads with cold temperatures, you're just shearing it. So the best keef is usually made very gently. Uh, we find that a lot of the bubble hash when people come to, or excuse me, a lot of the dry sift that people come to have us press for demonstrations is sometimes less than 50% trichomes and the rest plant material, detritus, all kinds of stuff. And that just doesn't do very well. So when you're making dry sifter keef, you know, you definitely want to be gentle on it. Less is more. I'm sure everyone has smoked keef, enjoyed keef, seen it, smelled it. Uh, keef can be a little tricky though because people want to beat it up a little bit too much. But the goal with both of these products is to keep the trichome heads as intact and unbroken as possible. When you start beating up keef, uh, you're gonna find that those trichome heads are splitting open, you're getting your oil and all these other things in your mixture, which is not gonna be conducive to rosin, which is where pretty much all this is heading and bubble hash and sift are now mainly being used as precursors that are being pressed into rosin because consumer preferences for keef have come way down. People simply aren't buying very much of it. A lot of the dry sift on the shelf <laughs> isn't very good in some places. Uh, so a lot of places are taking that keef and processing it into rosin. And same goes with ice water hash. You know, what could have passed as high quality bubble hash a couple years ago is now something that might not ever move on a dispensary shelf because of people's preferences and how they've learned to, you know, love other dabs basically. Uh, a lot of places that are doing all of these are still making full melt bubble hash, which is something that is fairly difficult to create, but what that essentially means is that is the highest quality level of your trichomes that you are receiving through your bubble hash washing process. Sometimes when you're washing hash, none of your trichomes are full melt. And full melt basically meaning that if you put it on a nail, you melt it, you're trying to dab it, there's zero residue left behind. So what many solventless extraction labs are doing that are focused on this are they will take their full melt bubble hash if they're able to produce it, they will sell that, in grams or half grams for high prices. And then the rest of their grades that wouldn't pass as full melt is what they're gonna go ahead and do is mix those all up together and then press it into rosin. So with rosin, you're using heat and pressure to break open the trichome heads and stalks, which is releasing the oil, and then it's being filtered through a fine mesh bag. So that leaves a lot of the plant material and the other stuff you don't want behind. It has the oil coming out. It doesn't need to be purged. It's ready to consume pretty much immediately. And this picture here, again, the fidelity isn't there, but that is actually an example of rosin shatter that's glassed over that somebody pressed out. So I just want to talk a little bit about the physics of rosin and how rosin is being made because people are going to find that rosin is extremely disruptive to the concentrate industry in general. Uh, rosin is something that people can safely make at home. So rosin is something that any amateur grower can purchase a rosin press and make dabs at home with their own material, knowing that they grew it, it doesn't have pesticides in it, they're comfortable with the quality that they're growing, hopefully, and that they can process it themselves. So what we've got here is a little bit of diagram that uh, one of my coworkers put together for us, which is either using compressed air or a hydraulic cylinder, you're pressing a bag that is full of keef, bubble hash, or flour, one of your substrate materials, the pressure is being applied and then in between heat and then you have your oil coming out and depending on the distance between the center of the bag and the edges of the plates, that's really gonna dictate sometimes how high quality your oil is. Sometimes people will press rosin on a giant t-shirt press. Uh, the evolution of rosin presses has come a long way from hair straighteners to t-shirt presses to commercial rosin presses to now, you know, we're on the verge of releasing a pretty much fully automated version of our press that press buttons, it presses, it goes. So in three or four short years, you've gone from, you know, guys Shanghai and their girlfriends and wives hair straighteners to squeeze the juice out of a nug to, you know, a fully automated system. So it's pretty incredible to see how fast things are changing here. Now, 
this is one of the really big categories that we get a lot of questions about, which is, you know, what are some of the advantages of solventless, and then where does solventless tend to struggle? And I wanted to present, you know, very honestly and openly where solventless has challenges is where is some of its advantages come in. So I'll start with the good, which is that it's vastly cheaper to get a solventless extraction system going. I mean, if you're trying to do bubble hash and rosin and you need sinks, you need you literally have an empty room and you are gonna start making solventless processing, you can get that going anywhere from twenty to forty thousand uh, dollars. you can get started much, much cheaper, more easily. It's it's very simple and you sim and you don't need that much to get going. Uh, it's it's much cheaper. The yields are comparable to hydrocarbon and other extraction methods, popular, contrary to popular belief. Uh, this all really boils down to quality, which is something I'll get into in the challenges section, but that you can get solid yields with solventless if you know your grower and your genetics are high quality, that's really where you're gonna be the most successful. Uh, one of the biggest advantages is that it doesn't require in-depth safety considerations. Uh, you know, C1, D1 rooms, people that are familiar with extraction rooms and build outs, uh, it can be extremely expensive. Some people can spend as much as $100,000 or $200,000 just getting a C1, D1 room architected and put in place, not even including the equipment that they're putting in there. So when you're pressing rosin, you're making bubble hash, there's no solvents, there's nothing flammable, it's pretty straightforward. Uh, the safety protocols are much more simple. Fire departments are very friendly. We work with the Denver Fire Department, and I actually gave a talk in LA earlier this year to fire departments, and they, they almost laughed me out of the room because of what I was talking about. Like, oh, solventless, like, why are you even here? We know that's fine. So the last thing we've got under the advantages is it retails for a really high price per gram. So again, every market in every area is gonna bear different prices depending on different consumer preferences. But like I was saying, you know, in California, in Colorado, you're seeing premium grams of these products retail from anywhere from 60 to $100, sometimes more on the recreational side of things. Think craft brewing, that's kind of the best analogy that we have is, you know, it's easier to get started with it, it's cheaper. Uh, most of the time that people are really involved in this, they have, you know, boutique genetics that they're really emphasizing and trying to put out there. Some of the big challenges with rosin, scalability, especially compared to CO2 or ethanol. I mean, if you're running a CO2 machine, you can put tons through those. With our equipment, which has some of the highest throughput on the market, you're looking at 10 to 15 pounds of dry sifter hash in a day, which is a lot for a rosin press, but compared to an ethanol or a CO2 machine, you know, that's, that's a drop in the bucket for massive, massive processing. So again, smaller production, if, you're, if you've got a bunch of low grade trim or middle stuff that you're trying to run, you know, rosin pressing might not be the right method for you because you have so much you have to go through, the quality might not be there, it's probably not gonna deliver the results that you're looking for. Uh, the real, real big thing here is that it demands high quality material and certain genetics to be successful. So if your material is very high quality, you can be successful. If your material is not, your yields will suffer you are not going to be making good bubble hash, you are not going to be making great keef, and you are not going to be pressing good rosin, frankly. So, you know, people sometimes they'll come do demos with us and they bring their oldest, swaggiest material they could find and they think, here, you know, I, I saw this, all this gold pouring out on your YouTube channel, can you do that? And, you know, we're not alchemists. You know, <laughs> ro rosin and solventless is not alchemy, you cannot turn lead into gold. And when it comes to solventless, it's really a, an arms race to who can be the best grower to make the best nugs, the top shelf crystal nugs to put into their solventless system. So Davlogic, for example, one of the companies in Colorado we work with, they probably make more rosin than anyone in Colorado. They work with a company called Verde Natural, which is their grow arm of the business. There are two companies and what they do is with Verde Natural, every time they pull a harvest down, Dab Logic comes in and they take all the buds they want. They get first pick. They come in, they pick out all the best stuff, and then they sell everything else on the shelf. Dab Logic washes it. Now, to some people, that is a, a horror story because they're selling their flour, they want to sell their best nugs. But again, as these markets evolve, uh, resin farming is going to be more and more of a thing where people are actually growing specifically for the purpose simply of extracting. Green Dot Labs in Boulder is a great example. There are innumerable examples in California, and 
of course, in the Northwest as well, there's less, but it's a growing practice where people are simply growing just to extract. They are not even selling their buds, they're washing it, they're blasting it, everything. And then again, it works best with premium flower, whole plant fresh frozen, or high quality sifted keef. You cannot just run trim through a rosin press. It is not going to be successful. There's too much plant material in the bag itself. Your yields will really suffer. So there's always a little bit of post-processing going on to make some of those premium products, whether you're washing your stuff into hash, whether you're sifting it, there's a little bit more work on the front end, a little bit less work on the back end because you don't have to purge it. Uh, whole plant fresh frozen is really the way that a lot of the elite labs are washing bubble hash to make the best quality products. And then one of the real big ones is it doesn't reduce or remove contamination. So if you've got PM in your product and you're trying to press it into rosin, well, you got PM in your rosin. And that is bad and nobody wants to smoke that, so please don't do that. That is my <laughs> humble request to all of you. <laughs> if you, whatever problems you're having in your grow, it's gonna come through the bag. There's just no way to get around it. You would need a micron screen of a coffee filter, three, four, five microns to be able to filter that out and, and maybe not even there. So, you know, it has to be clean. And if you've got a big crop of stuff that's contaminated, rosin and solvent list will simply not work unless you're trying to poison people. So, you know, a lot of people, they'll take that material and they'll blast it. CO2, there are better efficient ways to process material that's been compromised. Solvent list just simply is not one of those ways. So just some market information, just kind of go over what we got here. Uh, premium full melt bubble hash and live rosin can retail for $60 to $100 a gram. In 2017, rosin was the fastest growing subcategory in Colorado and Washington. The growth is really happening there. And then overall concentrate consumption growth has grown by 11% in Oregon last year. Uh, MJ Biz, I'd highly recommend anyone who doesn't purchase or check out their fact book, they come out with one every year. Them and Headset, they, it's, it's worth the money if you wanna learn the data. This is where this is pretty much all coming from. And then 13% of the processors polled reported using solventless as their primary extraction method. So to us, we were surprised to see that. We thought it would be less than that, but there's actually a lot of companies out there really pushing solventless and that number is absolutely growing. So getting towards the end here, uh, premium fresh frozen bubble hash can be turned into some really, really cool products that people wouldn't expect. Uh, on the bottom left here, you have 100% solventless cartridges that are being sold by DabLogic. No PG, no VG, no emulsifiers. It is coming off the press exactly as it goes into the cartridge. That is absolutely possible. Can't tell you guys how, they'd kill me, but it is happening. Uh, solventless sauce, it, that retails for so much, it's crazy. And then you've also got THC isolate. These are things we talked about, as well as food grade oil from leftovers. So whatever isn't your primo stuff can also be made into high-end edibles. So pretty much you can use all parts of the buffalo with solventless. No matter what you're doing, uh, there's a place for it. And again, the premium fresh frozen derived bubble hash is really the building block for a lot of these exotic concentrates, textures, and things that are being made with rosin. Okay. So in sum, you know, solventless concentrates are really quickly becoming a huge part of the market here, uh, especially the high-end market because of versatility. Someone can go buy a rosin press, make all these different textures at home, and you could be a, a one-man band and, and make some of these products. You don't have to invest a million dollars in getting your extraction lab started. Most of our customers are actually existing processing labs that might do hydrocarbon or CO2 as their primary extraction method, but they add on solventless to create a premium product. So it doesn't take up a lot of space. It's easy to get started. It's also very simple to learn. So we really see solventless is becoming, you know, one of the bigger ends of the boutique concentrate market as things evolve in the United States and abroad. It's a highly versatile system. You can make all kinds of different products with it. It's not very expensive and it's very safe and easy to learn. So, you know, as it becomes more known, we're expecting more and more and more people to really latch onto this and have, you know, my little grow, I'm gonna process some of this and then I'm gonna share it. So these are some of the big companies we work with. Willamette Valley Alchemy is here in Oregon, same with Queen Bee Labs. Uh, they do really great work and we were actually at a dispensary yesterday and we saw some Willamette Valley Alchemy hash. We were really excited to see that. There are definitely companies out here making really good products. So I'm pretty much 
right there. Uh, thank you all for coming. Uh, love to answer as many and all questions. And whatever questions that we don't get through in the next couple minutes, uh, we're at booth 406 right in the front. Please come talk to me. Come talk to us. Uh, we're here all weekend and love to answer whatever questions don't get there. So. So if you have a question, go ahead and raise your hand. We've got about 10-12 uh, minutes for questions, and I'll bring you the mic. Oh, jeez. The back? Back in the back? So if you have a, a pound of really high premium flour, and you take it through a, a good rosin press, say, from your company, yep. uh, what kind of yield in grams of rosin comes out the back end in a typical situation? Yeah, great question. Uh, there's a range of yields. We see anywhere from 10 to 30%. So with premium high resin strains, you know, well-grown Gorilla Glues, chem strains, there are certain strains that really overperform. You're gonna see in the high teens, low 20s, and that's just with flower rosin. The highest I've ever personally witnessed was 31 or 32% roughly. Out in California, some guy had some material that didn't even look good and it just poured. So to expand on that question just a little bit too, with Keef and Sift, you're looking at 30 to 60 percent for sift rosin and then for bubble hash anywhere from 40 to 80 percent we've seen it go as high as into the high 80s some people have claimed low 90s we're not really sure where that falls but with bubble hash it goes way up from there raise your hand if you've got a question there there you go Um, we, uh, I used the, uh, the freeze dryer mm -hmm. and uh, you put like you put like four or five pounds of wet sabi, you know, yep. bubble hash in the freeze dryer and um, when you break it out, you get like these, you get these wafers, they weigh like nothing, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? But then the liquid that comes out of the freeze dryer smells so good, mm -hmm. you'd slap your own mother for what's in there, <laughs> but you just have this cloudy, foggy material with this light oil film that like builds up on the top of it. Yeah. Um, why is all my wonderful yummy smells leaving my bubble hash in the freeze dryer, man? Yeah, so good and question. And how in God's our name do I get them back in there? Yeah, so when you're freeze drying bubble hash is what's happening is you are warming up and freezing. It's the sublimation process of your trichome head. So when they're in the freeze dryer, they're gonna be warmed up slightly. It's all happening under a vacuum. So that water that's coming out, that's draining out, can have a lot of terpenes in it. You know, it's coming out of the drain. Wow, this, this smells so good. So good. Yeah, yep. <laughs> so the short answer is that it kind of comes down to process. You know, we could, we come, come by the booth and let's talk about that yeah. because temperatures, dry times, how long you're drying it. Yeah. There's ways to try and minimize terpene, passive terpene loss through your, uh, you know, the water that's actually being extracted. Um, there are definitely methods and things that we can, you know, hopefully point you in the right direction on on that. Awesome. You know, good bubble hash when it's being freeze dried right, the terpene content. You know, ho hopefully your hash on the other end is still smelling is still smelling really good. Uh, but there's definitely some ways and things that you can even do with that water potentially. So how cool because I've been saving it. <laughs> Got fans of it. Okay, cool. I've got a question in the same vein. Yeah. So, so some of my clients are running into uh, processing uh, rosin that's really terpy, okay. and it has a hard time staying uh, shelf stable because yep. the terp layer tends to separate. Mm -hmm. Do you find that that is more process oriented or more cultivar or strain oriented? Good question. So what we find a lot is very high terpene content rosin tends to be uh, less viscous. So it's very oily, it can be hard to work with. A lot of it comes down to storage properly, so making sure it's in an airtight container as best you possibly can, making sure it's in a refrigerator or a freezer, you know, slowing that process down because with a lot of rosin, if you leave it out, it will naturally tend to auto butter. You're gonna get that separation, it kind of sweats. So it depends on the strain, it depends on the material, kind of the, the, the short answer is storage can probably have a huge effect on how well the separation slows way down. We tend to have customers telling us that when they're doing it right, that their shelf stability is somewhere in the realm of two to three months if they're using those techniques. Uh, if you leave it out at room temperature, if you're leaving it in a non-airtight container, it can, I mean, 24 hours, it, it can auto butter sometimes. So, and then the strain itself, again, I think that boils more down to the terpene content within it and what kind of textures you can have available to you. Other questions? What would you say in general are the best strains to put through one of your pieces of equipment? Yep. What so kind of strains are you looking for? At the baseline, more resin, higher potency is going to 
there, there's more to work with there when you're making rosin. So again, Gorilla Glue, almost a little played out at this point. People still love it. Huge producer. Uh, a lot of the chem strains really, really do well. Chem dogs, there's, there's a million bat crosses in the chem strain. Uh, one, of the, one of the companies that we work with a lot, Oni Seed Co, Tropicana Cookies, there's some fruity strains that work really, really well. Crockett's Farm, some people might be familiar with them. Straw Nana, there's some fruity strains. Uh, I, I wish I had a more specific answer about the exact terpene profile that some companies have latched onto that they know overperform. Uh, I was given the explanation once, but it kind of fell right through my head because it was super high level. Uh, but basically your very resinous, high yielding, high potency plants are always gonna be typically overperformers when it comes to making solventless. Right now, we got time for one more. You know you have it. Guess it was that good. I, it's not, yeah, I guess that you covered everything. Well, let's give it up for Eric. Thank you very much.